So I believe we are recording now. So, hi Phil, good to see you mate. Hi mate, you alright? I'm very well indeed. Thanks for coming on to talk about audiobooks. And pleasure, absolute pleasure. And being the, the, the man, the, the voice, the, the legend. Voice. Um, no, it's a, it's a great honour and a privilege to be your voice. That's weird. Yeah, that is weird, isn't it? So audio books are the new books, apparently. Yeah, and I mean, especially at the moment, where um, they have a kind of uh, real, I mean, they were reinvigorated before lockdown, but now I think people even more so are leaning towards getting audio books to pass the time. Um, but they're definitely more popular than they've ever, than they've ever been. Yeah, a lot, was a, lot to, a lot of the um, audio books are out selling the actual paper versions of the book. Yeah. Um, there's a statistic by statistic, and it's a good job you do this job, not me. Statistic. Statistics um, by Deloitte that predict that the global market will grow by 25% this year to 2.6 billion pounds. Well, I need to get some more work then. It's a lot of money. Yeah, it's a load money. of money. I mean, it's good, really. I mean, it's it's good, obviously, from a personal perspective. I love, I like reading audiobooks. It's fantastic. Um, um, but I also think it's there's an immediacy to it that the internet's opened up. Which beforehand, if you wanted an audiobook, you'd have to go to well a bookshop and buy a CD of the book you wanted. They were very expensive and quite cumbersome as well. If you wanted to listen to one in your car. I mean, I, I remember I was used to listen to the um, Tony Robinson, uh, Terry Pratchett audiobooks, like, or like loads and loads of them. But mm. you used to have to save up forever to get one, yeah. and then I'd get one and you'd get this kind of like massive box. Yeah, I've got them. The publisher sent them to me, and I don't know what to do with them because who, who uses like them? Eight, you know, eight. Well, I used to listen to a cassette, but eight cassettes mm. um, of audio, and then you'd get to the end of cassette why this is the end of cassette one please turn over for chapter six and then you turn over and then uh, it was really awkward whereas now it's so immediate like i you know i stuff i listen to on audible i just i can order it and i'm listening to it within 15 seconds yeah and i'm listening to a new book um and, and also you, you, you can speed it up you can listen to it in one and a half time times the speed yeah you do that don't you i like I, i've done it if it's um if it's non-fiction and I just want the information. I've done that. I can't. Oh, there was one guy who had a really droney voice. So I turned it up. I turned <laughs> Was it, it up, me? <laughs> it wasn't you. I turned it up to one and a half speed and it just made his voice, it just improved the tone of his voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but apparently young males are the biggest consumers of audiobooks. I don't know if that's really? or not. Yeah. Young it's interesting, males. actually. Um, certainly, actually, most of the people I know that are totally hooked on the audiobook experience are um, young, well, I'd say middle-aged guys. A lot of people say they listen to it in the gym, when they're driving, um, you know, walking the dog, all those sorts of things. And I suppose, actually, we've got to a point where the way that we consume um, material of all kinds is so, uh, is non-dependent on where we are and what we do. And especially with things like, you know, you've told me in the past that you're always kind of listening with your ear pods in mm -hmm. and you can be doing a bunch of other stuff and listening to the no whatever novel you're listening to at the time. Yeah. That's a, that is quite, you know, it's quite a new experience. There's so little hassle involved. Mm. Um, but I'm quite surprised. Yeah, I'm quite surprised there's more, more of a male listenership than there is female. Yeah, I, I gladly sort of will do jobs around the house. If, I, if I'm given a job around the house, I'll gladly say, yeah, I'll go and do that. I'll put the earpods in. And um, mm. it's just, you get some time on your own. You get to consume, a, consume something, a story or nonfiction or whatever, while you're doing a job as well. So it's quite, a, yeah, two birds with one stone. I've started doing, I mean, uh, doing certainly your books. Um, when I was doing Camelot, um, doing, I was doing the drive to the studio. And I, I was like doing the most meta thing possible. I was listening to myself read an audio book to go and read an audio book um because obviously you know it had been a, a year or so since i'd read the last one or you know mm. spoken the last one and i kind of need to remind myself of what the characters were and who they were and the tone so, so it's not just a question of sort of audio self-pleasuring <laughs> 
I mean, there was a bit of that. I was listening to bits going, <laughs> that was all right. <laughs> uh, but there's also those bits you listen to and you're like, oh no. Mm. It's funny, my little boy said to me today, today he's like, he said, Daddy, does, does, when I record myself, does my voice sound like my voice normally sounds? And I thought, yeah, it's that thing where most people um, don't, they hate the sound of their own voice when they, <laughs> they, hurt, they hear it because it's not what you hear inside your own head. Yeah. And now I've got to the, I've gone beyond that to such a degree that I don't, I, mean, I don't know what my, <laughs> my normal voice sounds like. I'm so used to hearing it recorded or in my ears as I'm recording something. You've got too many characters in your head as well. But yeah. um, what, what we're going to do here is I've had, I asked a lot of the readers if they would send in any questions they have about the process of recording an audiobook because it is a massive grey market. People seem to be really into audiobooks. I enjoy them. Um, they're not as yet replacing physical books. So, so as far as I can gather, publishers aren't worried about them replacing it. They're, they're just an addition to print books. So I think at the moment it's a pretty cool thing. I, I kind of enjoy the process of having the books turned into audiobooks. So, so I, I've asked them to send me the questions. So I've got quite a few questions to get through. What so um, I hope you're ready for some. And just for the, for the listeners, Phil doesn't know what I'm going to tell him at all. So, you know, let's hope, let's hope he's Thank prepared. Um, but having said that, seeing as Camelot is kind of, you know, in season. Imminent. Let's, let's start there and say it's in season. It's, season. it's sort of like an animal. It's a beast that's ready to... It's ready. Yeah. So um, I wondered if you could sort of just tell us a little bit about the, your experience of recording Camelot for a start, mm -hmm. because it should be pretty fresh in your mind. Um, yeah. You know, what was, what was good about recording Camelot, and I dare say what you didn't enjoy so much about recording Camelot? Uh, okay. Um, Camelot actually, it, Camelot's probably, I don't want to say it's my favourite audio, but, oh, oh my God, sorry, I've got um, phones going off. Okay, um, you, can, you can repeat that. Let me fix that before I answer this question. I hope that doesn't happen when my audio. Technology failure, sorry about that. Um, so, Camelot, um, I was looking forward to immensely. Uh, obviously, I'd read the book before um, before uh, I'd started, you know, before, long before I'd started the, the prep from an audio perspective. Um, and in a lot of respects, it was just comfortable for me because I was going back to a world that I knew and loved after Lancelot. Um, to characters that I knew and loved and for the sort of excitement of from my own perspective as a reader I'm I'm just kind of joyful of the fact that I get to go back to that world and experience those people and places um, I always um, I always spend a lot of time thinking about who the new characters are going to be um, sometimes I give characters more thought than others um, I'd sort of Certainly, there was um, there were certain people that I was just going to see how they fell out at the moment, and I do that quite often with characters because I think if often if I overthink them, they can become a little bit too rehearsed, or I try too hard to find a different accent or whatever. Um, so I I really was excited by the prospect of inhabiting some of the new characters. Um, but at the same time, yeah, a lot of work goes into the prep. The, the thing that really always gets me with your books is just the obscure places and people's names, um, some of which are actually unpronounceable. Um, yeah, and it's not my problem, you know? No, and it's not your problem. And I, and I do that thing where I ring you up and I'm like, dude, how the hell do you say that? And you're like, I don't know. I just saw it written. I know, <laughs> right. you, you do the pronunciation. <laughs> Um, and I know that you know. I know that there's there's a lot of discrepancy with certainly in you know in the in the dark ages. There's so little reference, and you were working with a lot with a mixture of Welsh, Cornish, Old English, um, you know, Irish, uh, and uh, and a mixture of the three different mythologies, different people from different places, um, and a lot of that 
I've tried not to get too bogged down in because if you do, you, I, you know, it would just take me forever to, yeah. to do an audio book. So it's just not possible in places. But then again, you know, obviously you do whatever you can. And it's not just me, my producer as well, spend, spend, will read the book and go through it and the two of us will kind of bounce backwards and forwards and I'll say, well, I think it should be something like this and she'll say, no, well, in my experience, it's some blah, blah, blah. Um, and sometimes I've made mistakes um, beforehand, like if I've made a mistake in Lancelot, for example, mm. I know that there was, um, I can't remember which one it was, who was it? It was, um, oh no. Oh, Tormeg, that's right, the horse. Mm -hmm. um, and the Tormeg was the way that I pronounced it to begin with. Um, yeah. But that's not the Irish pronunciation. I can't remember exactly what the Irish pronunciation is, yeah. but it, um, it was. Someone um, will let us know. Yeah, someone I'm sure will let us know. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, for me, it was a joy. Like, Camelot was just an absolute pleasure for me from start to finish because I got to go back to a place that Sadly, when I re-listened to Lancelot, I started re-listening to it to familiarise myself with the characters. And then within a very short space of time, I found myself falling back into the bit, back in love with the story. Um, and, you know, very, I suppose, narcissistically, driving along in my car, crying, listening to, like, the, the emotional sections. Thinking, Give me a baby. This is so emotional and I'm such a dick because I'm listening to myself and I'm crying. You made yourself cry, mate. That's how good you are. I, well, you made me make myself cry. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But I, think, I think people will be interested to know that when it comes to the characterizations, Merlin is, is a character who particularly, to, to me, stands out in your, uh, in your narration. And... Mm -hmm to the extent that now, so after hearing how you did Merlin in Lancelot, I wrote Merlin in Camelot with your voice delivering the dialogue in my head, which that's is cool. really strange. And I think that's sort of what happened with Sharp and Bernard Cornwall. I think, I think Bernard, someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Bernard Cornwall sort of thinks of Sean Bean now when he, when he, when he thinks of Sharp, you know? That's cool. And so you've- It's the same, the same with, um, with, uh... Jean Le Carre and um, George Smiley uh, with um, Alec Guinness. He said he actually had to stop writing George Smiley because it, it was getting in the way. He was just writing Alec Guinness playing George Smiley. But so I'll tell you that. It's <laughs> really useful though. For me, it's very, very useful because when you're writing characters on a page and, and you're writing dialogue, you look for little things that make their dialogue distinguishable from other people who are talking on the page. Just mm -hmm. the, like a, a, um, inflections or, or just little things they, the way they put their sentences together when they're delivering them. So when you give it that accent, it kind of, it sings in my head in a way that makes it more obvious to me how he would say certain things, which is really, really good. I, you know, that helps me out. Um, That's very flat flattering as well. It's very cool. I don't, suppose um, you, I don't suppose you'd give us any, any Merlin right now. You're just like a. Well, the, the thing about Merlin is basically he's like he's like a sexy Tom Jones kind of character, and then there's a great difference between the Merlin who was in Lancelot, and I'd say that's one of my favourite words to say is Lancelot. Um, but and in Camel. Lot of, and I've started to make him a little bit more, you know, certainly in the beginning he's not in a great way and so he's very husky and then as time goes by he starts to find himself a little bit more stronger and you know he's got a bit more richness about him. Um, yeah I mean it's like a, you know that the idea of that Welsh, um, early on I remember you talking about the character of um, Merlin to me and the fact that he was you no, know, he wasn't a kind of wizened old dude he was kind of he was strong and he I didn't want him to be Gan I didn't want him to be Gandalf. Yeah, or, exactly. You know what I mean? It would have been it would have been very easy on a cold read, not certainly you know, not being in, involved in the idea of the story as you made me. Um to have yeah, have been a bit more like Oh it's Merlin and um you, know, <laughs> yes. you shall not pass <laughs> um sorry Ian. Um <laughs> which, is, which is why even, why we didn't want to go there. Someone's done that, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and also it's, what, it's, it's what's expected. You know, Merlin, you haven't written Merlin as a grey bearded, 
you know, white long haired character who, who kind of is, it, it, Merlin, your Merlin is mysterious in a much more earthy and visceral way. Mm. And his wit, you know, the, the, these, the way he cuts people down is mm. phenomenal. Mm. Um, and part of the joy, I mean, I, in Camelot especially, it got to the point where I, I almost always relaxed Whenever I read Merlin, it was like, oh, okay, well, it's Merlin. Yeah, and cool. then suddenly I'm back and I'm playing Merlin again. Yeah, you know, he's great. stupid body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and maybe that's what you're going to be a bit like when you're a little bit older, mate, in a couple of years. I think it's quite likely. I'm getting that way now. Certainly, I'm, now I'm in isolation. This beard is, is becoming a bit Merlin esque. Yeah, yeah, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask a, a question from one of the readers. Um, mm -hmm. Let's have a look. Right, I'll ask a first question from Leslie Ann Cargill. And she says, she's been listening to Last a lot, um, having read the book already. So Ooh. that's good. So she's Double hitter, the book good choice. Her, now, but now listening to it and is loving it. Do you find that you connect more with certain characters than others when you're narrating? And does that influence how you tell the tale? Uh, yeah. Um, I have to I keep suppose it does. fairly short because we've got a lot to get through. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, I do definitely connect more with um, some characters and that's actually often a problem is that if I, when I start reading a character and I don't quite feel them, I find it, it holds me up and I end up stumbling over their lines or stopping and wanting to go back to their lines again, which isn't particularly useful when doing an audio book. Um, so I try and put the legwork in, begin with. Actually with these books, it's, it, this was never like for um, the only time it became a problem was in Camelot. There's a section where we meet a group of um, warriors who later on in the book um, who we uh, don't know. And I was so used to having familiar characters around me that when I got to the new ones, I was like, oh, oh my God, who's, who's this guy going to be? Um, uh, uh, I haven't assigned him a voice yet. Yeah, exactly. I haven't, you know, I haven't given him a character yet. Um, uh, so yeah it does make a difference it does make a difference and sometimes it's frustrating when you don't find someone but actually quite i mean i've even gone back and started recording a character again completely from their first line because i've got like three paragraphs in and i'm like no no no, no. this is this isn't right this isn't this person mm. i don't i don't believe that this person i'm not believing this character let me give me two minutes to my producer and i'll go through a few things and I think, right. okay yeah that's it now i'm comfortable with it that's the one that's who he is you know I think I ended up with a couple of like of the Geordie in, in Camelot at some point and was like, why not? You know, I mean, ultimately, he's, he's got four lines. We're going to make him Geordie. Yeah, why not? I, look, I haven't heard that yet, so I look forward to No, that. you know, <laughs> neither have I. Uh, next question from Ryan Kenny. He says, well, a lot of people have asked a similar question. So I'll, um, I'll read them all out in one go and then we can, you can tackle it as you see fit. Ryan Kelly yes. says, how do you remember each voice when reading the book? He's tried narrating his own manuscript as it helps him in the editing process, which I can understand listening to it. Um, and it's ridiculously hard to recall all the inflections as you feel seem to do with such ease. Ian Banks says, how do you remember the different voices and accents? And did you base any characters on someone you know? So that's a good one. <laughs> and Anna, Anna Mikowska, Tom, as you said, so how do you remember which voice to use for each character. So a lot of people are very interested in how you managed to do that. Okay, so thanks, Ryan. Nice one. Um, and who else was it? Anna and Ian. Anna, Ian. Um, yeah, it's a pain um, <laughs> remembering. When, like, the worst thing is certainly with your Viking books. Mm. When I was coming up to doing like book three of... Um, of the first Viking series, there was a no, sorry, yeah, because I recorded the um, I recorded the God of Vengeance, the series, right, series, right, the first, series first, before the Raven and then I did the Raven books afterwards, which was a lot easier because it just meant that I knew the characters right off, and it actually worked really well because it was it was in chronological order, yeah. despite the fact of not being in written order. Um, and I found that there was there was a gap between doing uh, Winter's Fire and Wings of the Storm, and I went back to it and sort of was like, oh. Oh, who, who was who? And I, and I found it really difficult to kind of just snap back into the characters. But actually, um, I, I don't know if it's, I really don't know what it is. I don't know if it's an acting background thing. I don't know whether it's, um, 
uh, I don't know, a defense mechanism or what, I find that if I, kn if I feel the characters, like I was talking about a second ago, if I can actually feel them, I just fall back into the character. So I know that if I'm doing, you know, if I'm doing Merlin and Guinevere, then Guinevere is going to be up here and she has a certain lightness and it's, I always try not to do girl voices. Like yeah, a big that's deal. probably a good thing. I mean, we don't want, we don't want any Monty Python. Apparently, so, some readers do. You know, we do have the Monty, Monty Python ladies. Um, He's not I'm, the messiah. He's, He's a very naughty boy. Um, and I'm just not into doing that. I just, I think that actually it's patronizing and it's, uh, it's stupid. So I try and find different layers of female voice. Um, but actually, if, if the characters are written well, you just know who they are and you know yeah. that that's the guy. Um, do you, you know, base them on anyone you know? That's, that's part, another part of that question. What's that? Do you base them on anybody you know? Well, obviously you've got to... No, actually, no. I don't base, base them on anybody I know. I often base them on... Uh, I start with a famous person mm -hmm. or at least a well-known actor and then I'll dial it in one direction or another. So for example, um, who have we got? Um, so um, there's a king in Camelot. I'm trying not to give too much away in any of this. There's a king in Camelot um, who I based on Richard Harris in Gladiator. And um, I found Maximus that uh, and I, you know, and I find keywords often help. So I'll do things like, you know, Maximus the Merciful, um, or I'll can, do. Can I, just I'll, can I just tell everyone at home when Phil and I hang out and go to the pub, I get him to do these voices over a pint. <laughs> it, it just it amuses me. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I, I do often, and you know, like I'll find maybe like uh, I, I did a couple of background people, certainly in battles. Brian Blessed turns up, and he's you know, okay. so. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that's sort of, that, that sort of thing. So I, I often I'll go through people. Um, I think I think Sean Bean does make an appearance in Camelot at some point. And um, well, I think one of the actually one of the guards in uh, in 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 uh, Camelot at the end, one of the uh, nights. You know, I won't go into any like you know details, but he's definitely got a Sheffield ledge to him. Mm. Um, and so it's a lot of it's localized. Yeah. Sometimes it's really difficult because actually on the, with the Sigurd and the Viking books, it, they're, they're all set in Norway. Yes. Um, and the Raven books were fine, but the Sigurd series was more difficult. Um, but that was because quite, yes. I can't do a range of Norwegian accents. Um, no. And you've got like a cast of 40 people plus. Yeah. Um, and the chances of me doing 40 Norway, different Norwegian accents were pretty slim. Um, I so I then I don't must have enjoyed the Scottish guy that we, we uh, that ended up in uh, Winter's Fire. I think there's a there's a Scottish assassin. Beyond. Yeah. So yeah, he was lovely. Doing... I loved. It. I mean, he was horrible. What a horrible guy. It was a horrible um, character. Yeah. But yeah, I loved. It was um, it was nice to be able to do someone a little bit different, mm -hmm. and there was a kind of loyalty, sort of threat about him, um, okay. which was uh, which is always you know it's good to. I was thinking once again when you when you get a character like that, I was thinking that maybe it's like um, you know there's a bit of you and McGregor in there, and it's you know take you in and then you bend him a little bit and you make him a bit gruffer, and you make him uh, you know a little bit more um, tight, tighter in the mouth, um, and that was Fion, and he was kind of slow and deadly. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't have, I don't, uh, I tend to try and slip into characters pretty easily and sometimes I lose them, sometimes I lose the way. If, to begin with, when I was doing Merlin, um, because he was Welsh, you know, the classic would get in and then suddenly I was talking in Indian and it was, <laughs> or Scottish was the other thing, like suddenly. There was one scene in Lancelot where they're at the, they're at the pool with the, um, with the Druidess, priestess yeah. in mm -hmm. Scotland. And I had like, three different colloquial English accents, Merlin's Welsh, three Scotsmen, um, all in one scene, all talking together. And yeah. yeah, that was that was difficult to flip between. And this is why, so I've been doing some readings in the garden of Camelot just to sort of hopefully whet people's appetites and it just feels like something something I can do to get, you know, to, to sort of yeah, you're trying to put me make, people aware of, to make people aware of the book. And sometimes some some people say, "Why don't you read the audiobooks? 
yourself. And that is why, because I wouldn't have <laughs> a chance in hell of, yeah, I can read a bit of prose, you know, without tripping up too many times. But the characterizations that you bring to the, to the novel, the acting, is because, you know, you have acted a, few, a fair bit. You know, I don't think people, people won't necessarily know your background, but it's, you have done a little bit of acting, mate, haven't you? A little bit, yeah. A little yeah. bit. So, I mean, the, but there's, an, there's also an issue with that. I heard, um, who was it? Uh, I can't remember. I had a very famous actor who was doing an audiobook the other day who said, no, you must never put characterization in an audiobook. And I thought, eh, I don't, I personally don't agree. Oh, some people don't, though, don't, you know. But some people don't, and I get why, I totally understand. And actually I've found that I've done some books that have been harder to characterize than others mm. um, by different authors. And that's, and I also, you know, some don't feel like they need it or they don't deserve, not deserve it, but they don't lend themselves to big yeah. characterization. Um, and I've, I've talked to, I remember I did, a, I did a dual read audio book a while back and the woman who was doing the audio book, she was like, no, don't characterize, you know, don't turn it into an audio play. And maybe, maybe they're right, I don't know, but that's just not, I can't do that because yeah. for me, it's, it's creating a world. It's, mm. you know, I, I want to feel every single character. I want to hear their different voices mm. in my own experience from listening. Um, I think I mean, it's great. It, it adds something because you read the book and you've got the book and, you, and you've got to do it all in your head, haven't you? Unless there's mm -hmm. some indicator that says he's Scottish or whatever, you've got to, you've got to do it in your head. Uh, so when you bring characterization to the audiobook, it makes it something new. It's, it's an interpretation to a certain extent. Yeah. So I think that it's, and I'm not just saying this because I want people to, to, uh, to buy the book and then the audio book, but you could get something completely new out of the audio book by listening to you deliver it because of the characterizations. So it's, it's a different medium. Man. And uh, you know, I think to try and ignore that is silly. Mm. because it is a different medium. And I also get that, you know, there's a lot of readers out there that perhaps um, don't read books themselves, like, you know, maybe people who have, are of um, hard of sight or, yeah. um, you know, for whatever reason, don't, or, you know, maybe um, suffer from dyslexia or whatever, don't find it as easy to pick up a book and sit and read it, but they have time. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I myself, when I listen to a book, I, I want to have... Uh, I want to have an interpretation rather than mm. just kind of a bland, blank yeah. reading that I interpret of my own record. Yeah. But that's just, well, that's just me. I think it's working, mate. Look at the reviews on Audible. So the next <laughs> question is from Dean Duplacis, and he says, which books were the most, or which book was the most challenging to read? And I assume he's just talking about mine. And which did you enjoy the most? And it, I yeah. didn't. And he'd love to hear you read uh, The Bleeding Land. Um, oh, I'd love to read The Bleeding Land. Like, uh, when is the, when is, when, when, when's, when's the publisher going to make that happen? Um, well, there is a version out there, read, narrated by um, a, a, a beautifully, uh, Anthony May. Beautifully narrated, yeah. it has to be said. It, there is a great version out there, but selfishly, I just want to do it. Um, only because oh. I love those books. And also, at some point, we're going to need a third book. Um, yes, but that's true. You know that. Um, okay, so uh, what books I find most challenging? Um, I think I probably found the um, Sigurd books the most challenging because, as I said earlier, they're all set in Norway. Mm -hmm. A, the pronunciations were vast, and in a lot of cases, I've had quite a bit of stick about pronunciations in I, I love that books. some people I love that some people say pronunciations and some say pronunciations. Pronunciations that sums it up, doesn't it? Exactly. Um, potato, potato. And um, it's understandable. I mean like I've had I've had reviews I mean, you know, the majority of them are very favourable and that's wonderful, thank you. Um, but some of them do say, you know, oh the the reader's pronunciations were all over the place. He tried, bless him. Well he um, even, even characterises the reviews on Amazon, <laughs> gives them an accent. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I found them I found them difficult because I couldn't just almost like I make it easy for myself, and you know I'm like, well, if it's set in the UK, I'll just do uh, X accent, or if it's a modern book, maybe you know I've got the whole world to choose from from an accent perspective. Mm. Um, 
whereas it when it's just when it's Norway and I'm just dealing with tone yeah. so it's just about the very very slim variations I can give mm. you know between Olaf who's you know down there and he's very gruff and then Sigurd who's a lot more clipped and uh, matter of fact that that's great but then when you've got a cast of 40 to 50 people it becomes more difficult as time goes on you have to be more imaginative um so that was the most difficult those were the most difficult i mean by the third book i was kind of hopefully i've kind of cracked it a bit but yeah certainly the first book god of vengeance which i loved reading mm. i found the characterizations difficult well um, that leads us into the next question actually mm -hmm. sulfur red at um, science rocks some of these are handles obviously on twitter and i don't know the names of them is currently oh, right. reading Wings of the Storm and would like to hear a bit of Sigurd, please, if that's possible. Can you give us a little bit of Sigurd? Can you remember? I've actually got some Wings of the Storm. In a while. Just, I've got some Winter's Fire, actually, sat right okay. by it. Um, and because um, they're all first person, it kind mm -hmm. of, I suppose, it's, um, it all makes sense. Wings of Fire, the, um, the middle book of the Rise of Sigurd trilogy. Mm, that's great. Yeah. Um, trying to find some Sigurd but then it's all Sigurd because it's first person so mm. <clears throat> um, okay Sigurd felt the cold air on his teeth he says the truth is as welcome in a good story as a fart under the furs they could have waited until morning before setting out but Asgot had smelt new snow in the air or seen it in his rooms perhaps and Sigurd would not risk another fall covering, covering the tracks. Beside which, he welcomed any excuse to let Hakon Burners get out of Hakon Burners Hall. I'm doing well here. I have been drinking whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've lost uh, Sigurd. Uh, oh my God, see, you need to write more Sigurd dialogue. Um, he doesn't say a lot, except it's all him. I tend well, to, basically, I tend to make sounded most a bit of... Like, it sounded a bit like you, mate, really. So well, that's, that's, yeah. that's important, as, important aspect of it, is actually most of the leads of your books um, are me, because I've played with the idea of doing an entire book in another accent, and that seems like madness to me, um, and would take a very long time. Um, to get right but also they're the heroes of the book and i suppose like all readers i imagine myself as the hero of the book um not all readers all writers oh exactly i mean that, i suppose that's you know that's part of the escapism of it but you know like lancelot was very much me you know i felt like it was me i was living lancelot's life as i was reading it galahad was is very much like me and so sigurd was the same deal um if it's also, uh, I feel like it's, it's more of a uh, comfort to the reader, to the listener, sorry, um, to have that kind of place to go to, which is, which is always going to be my voice. Mm -hmm. um, as long as they like my voice, I suppose, the, the other yeah. option. The other problem is that if you don't, which happens with audiobooks, and I, I'm mm. kind of very accepting of the fact, accepting of the fact, sorry, that um, some people don't like people's voices and you start yeah. reading this and I've done it myself I've listened to audiobooks by really competent readers and in a short space of time I'm like there's just yeah. something about this voice that I can't get on with I've done the same thing and I think that's one of the amazing things about audible is that if you don't get on with it you can you can say you know what this isn't going to work for me and they'll just they'll exchange your book for another one I think that's really yeah. cool because you don't know with a, with a voice you've got to live with it for a long while yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, your books are yeah. 26 hours long. Yeah, then, yeah, I'll try and do a short one one of these days. So, um, next question. Okay, so this is from Mark Daly. How many times do you need to read the book before you feel you can do the whole story justice? And he says, phenomenal narration, by the way. You really bring the characters to life. Oh, thank you, mate. That's very nice of you. Um, because before you read them, the characters are really flat. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> just, just subtext in there yeah i mean you know I, I do what i can with the material provided um and often it's not easy yeah um, sorry um i i mean i uh, with giles's books i suppose it's slightly different i uh, we kind of kind of talk to giles quite a lot about the books as he's creating them so i get an opportunity to get at least an inkling of the idea as we're going forward 
Um, a little bit more than an inkling, mate. I have uh, moaned to you on many occasions about being, you know, I'm stuck in a plot hole. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm a little bit more familiar with them than I am with some of the other books that I do audiobooks for. Um, but at the same time, I normally read it twice before I sit down and read it. I don't try, try not to read it any more than that because actually what happens is, is you lose, there's a kind of spontaneity that you can find with certain passages or a immediacy that you find with battles or with kind of moments of action that I, I try and find a weird instinctive flow to. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a sort of alchemy attached to it that I that maybe doesn't happen with other readers and maybe they're far more prepared than me and maybe they spend a lot more time doing their notes and their character breakdowns and so on and so forth than I do but there's a sort of there's a lyrical kind of kung fu quality to it that I I like um, so I don't I try not to read it too much but yeah I'll normally read a book at, at the worst once before I start reading at the best twice and I won't read it anymore now. Uh, all I can think of is lyrical kung fu. I like that a lot, and I might, I might go now and um, purchase. The, that's what. That's the URL. down to you. You create lyrical kung fu lyrical for me to do. Um, I imagine there are a lot of audio readers who just go and sit down cold and just start reading. Just apparently so. Just I, I mean, uh, that, that to me, I, I you know, I've, as far as I've lived, obviously talking to the producers I work with, a lot of people do that, and mm -hmm. um, I, I could not in a million years do that. It would be terrifying. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you don't. Scary enough as it is. Uh, Matt Dean um, says, I'm interested to know more about how Philip prepares for a recording. How many times does he read the manuscript beforehand, which we've covered? What notes does he make? And how does he decide how a character's voice should sound? So we've covered some of that. Uh, I guess the, the main one that we have in here is how you prepare for it. Prepare for yeah, OK. Um... I, um, like I said, I'd go through a lot of characters. I try and make the key characters, like I'll make notes on, for a long time I worked off of paper. So I worked off a paper manuscript, um, which when you're dealing with books the size of Giles's isn't particularly um, ecologically friendly. So um, I then um, moved into the 21st century and got an iPad and started working off that instead, um, which has revolutionized my life, revolutionized my life to a certain degree. Um, so I used to like now I can still make notes obviously on the, on the on the text on my iPad and I'll get to a bit and it will be for example like the king I've mentioned earlier just say you know Richard Burton or you know or Richard Harris or whichever person I'm taking off in in that in that section um, that's one bit of preparation I do obviously pronunciations I phoneticize everything that I can research, so I'll go through a book and every single find, whether it's a pronunciation or whether it's just a normal word, because uh, all authors love to, to use words that no one else in, in the world used, um, that they've unearthed in a dictionary somewhere, um, and think, that sounds clever. Um, and so quite often I'll come across words, I'm like, I've never even heard that word before. So those words, those pronunciations, I do a lot of research and a lot of phonetical um, notes on. Um, I still find that paper notes is the best thing for me. I tend to, to kind of make lots and lots of paper notes. Um, and I'll make notes about sequences as well. There's certain like, levels of emotion that you, that you want to put into things. You, do, you sort of don't want to go too far in places and you don't want to hold back in others. I mean, I've done sequences for, certainly for, you know, for Lance Lang and Camelot that I've, you know, I've been in floods of tears doing and I need to know when to stop, when to stop being that emotionally engaged. And yeah, just yeah. go, okay, this is the next bit and it's serious and it needs a completely fresh palette. Um, so yeah, there is quite a bit of preparation. I do. I also do a lot of vocal exercises. Driving in my car, I'll be going, you know, you know, doing all sorts of um, red lorry, yellow lorry, red lorry, yellow lorry, red lorry. She sells seashells on the seashore. Um, that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, it's fascinating. This is great stuff, mate. This is very, <laughs> very interesting. Mike Arnold. Who you know, Mark, uh, Mr. Arnold from the Civil War Chronicles and more recently. Why I still don't know why I'm not doing his audiobooks, Mike. You know, Mike, what's going on there? Uh, he asked if you ever consult me on the characters' accents or do you just crack on and make them up? He just cracks on 
and oh, yeah, I was gonna say, that's, a, that's a question that's a question for you it is a question for me <laughs> yeah see yeah i think you know the cut of phil's jib by now he doesn't ask me i might um chris bailey of the you know the bernard cornwall fan club he he I said uh, chris I did wonder to what extent Giles' previous career as a pro vocalist, well, thank you, Chris, comes into play during any discussions on voice projection, delivery, tone, inflection, etc. I speak as significant. I speak as someone who was fortunate enough to witness a rare and greatly appreciated live performance last year in Yorvik. In case you don't know, oh, about I thought I thought he was going to say a, li- a, a live performance of uh, of your previous vocal career. That would have been. Um, Oh, no, it wasn't. No, I was doing a uh, panel discussion with um, Sharon Bennett Connolly, uh, Matthew Harfey, Justin Hill, and um, of course Simon Turney, and for the Bernard Cornwall fan um, club. And we, I don't know what happened exactly, but I ended up singing um, the theme, Singing? The, the sharp theme tune. Um, of course you did. So that's why. <laughs> That's what happened. That's all I can say. That's what happened. And um, but the, but obviously, as a as a trained thespian, you don't really need any advice from me on on delivery and projection. No, but I mean, I suppose I do. Um, I remember. I remember saying. I remember talking to you about Merlin and saying, you know, are you okay making making him Welsh? Because there's no reference to him being Welsh, is there, in the books? No, no. no. And so I, you know. I think I was going off of the Nicole Williams, and, um, like that. I was taking that kernel of Merlin from a very early time um, from Excalibur, mm. and that for me was the that was my Merlin as a kid. I yeah. always would always go back to that Merlin, and I thought, well, that's once again, it's a different take on the Merlin we expect the grey hair and the grey beard. So I sort of started there, and I remember having a conversation with you about like you know. I might make him Welsh. And you were like, <laughs> whatever, dude, just go for it. <laughs> well, I don't think I would have said whatever if you, I mean, if you said I might make him a Brummie, I don't know if that would yeah. work so well. So. Not I, this year, relentless. <laughs> yeah. Through every twist and tear. Actually, I think it would have worked really well. I think it could have worked. Yeah. Can yeah. we, um, uh, Transworld, well, can we re-record the Can audio? we re-record, please, yeah. Yeah. It's really bad, so, like, this is about to finish this whiskey, but I had like a glass of wine left over from them, like a complete alcoholic. I tell you what, these actors. Um, Sorry, I'm going to have to speed, all about being speed up a little guy. bit on the answers, so stop waffling so much. Mm-hmm. Axel says, Axel, my little boy, he says, do you get nervous before you have to read the stories? Do you get nervous, uh, mate? Yeah, no. yeah, totally. No, well, no, I do. When I start a book, especially, uh, especially a book that I am really invested in, like, not that, you know, not that I'm not, you know, for any uh, prospective employers uh, who want me to read their audio books, obviously I'm hugely invested in every single book I read. Um, but certain books that I'm emotionally invested in in a completely different way, um, I find that when I start, I sort of start and I'm, I'm a little bit sort of tight in my chest and I, and I have to kind of read a bit, get over it, and then I'll, and quite often the producer's like, you're taking a lot of breaths in the beginning here. And I'm like, yeah, um, okay. Um, performance and nervous, that, that's good. That's exactly good. You know, if that's nervousness, but then that's adrenaline as well. And that's because I want to kind of jump in and do it and make it good. So yeah, I do definitely ax. I definitely get nervous. Um, but I think there's an old saying where, you know, they say, if an actor doesn't have nerves, then there's something wrong. And I do sort of agree with that. I think nerves isn't necessarily the right thing. Adrenaline is, yeah. you know, yeah, is yeah. the right description yeah. for that. Yeah. Freya, my daughter, says, is there a narrator out there who you admire and, um, you know, who you think is really, really great at, at doing this? That's an excellent question. I've got um, one, I'm going to say. Um, go it, um, Jonathan Keeble. Ah, oh, see. Who, who did the now, film? it's funny you said that. Yeah, Jonathan yeah, Keeble is like one of... See, I, I've got a story about this. I, um, uh, about uh, what was I he doing? Was, he was unavailable. That's why we got. Him. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I would have put him before me, even if I'd have known I was meant to be doing it. Um, yeah, Jonathan Gibb was amazing. And I, um, a couple, probably a month ago, I was in the same studio I did the Camelot in. I, was it Camelot? No, it wasn't Camelot. It was after Camelot. Um, 
and I was doing a different book and I came out of the studio and there was another artist in the next studio along and he was coming at the same time and I sort of shook his hand and he said, hello, hello, how are you? Um, and I introduced myself and he said, I'm Jonathan. Um, and then we went into the kitchen and for a second I thought, is that, nah, no. And I said to my producer, I said, who's, um, who's in the next studio? And she was like, John Jonathan. I said, Jonathan, watch when keyboard. I was like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> He's like my audio hero. Um, so then I totally fanboyed him in the kitchen where he was having his lunch and I was making a cup of tea and I was like playing it cool. Like, hi, Jonathan. Yeah, just um, doing this book in there and uh, big fan of your work. Um, but he was lovely. Um, yeah, he's great. Um, uh, there's a guy who, a younger reader who I listened to um, a little while back. I'm just seeing if I could find him actually. Um, he, he did... George R. R. Martin's um, Night of the Night of the Seven Realm, I think it was. Where was it? Because because listeners now will follow a, an audio reader, they'll follow a narrator, and, and want to listen to everything they've done. They have their own. Well, you you guys have your own fans. Which is uh, really well, yeah, I'm I'm yet to receive any. Um, 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 Harry Lloyd, Harry Lloyd is the guy. I mean, he's a fantastic actor. He played. Um, the young Baratheon king in Game of Thrones. Um, right. And he did um, Night of the Seven Realms by George R. R. Martin. I'm sure he's done some other work, but that's the one I've heard of his. And I remember listening to him and thinking, this guy is awesome. Like, yeah. uh, what so good to listen to. I'll tell you who I like as well is the guy who does... Philip Cor Stevens, yeah, I know. Cor I mean, Cor Yeah, only... Philip Stevens, yeah. who does the Cormac McCarthy novel. So I, I don't know his name because I, I should do, but he's... Oh, he's the, um, yeah, the, he's, he's like he's the Texan sort of... Yeah. He's got a proper Texan draw. In fact, I think, and this is such an this is such an audio book thing to do, but I think I've actually I, once again I've had lunch with him in a green room. Right. Um, <laughs> like, I met some weird people in green rooms. Um, uh, yeah, so, so <laughs> I, as, as it happens, but that's diff, that's a different yeah. for another time. Yeah. Uh, so let's go on to Ray Jones. He says he's never ever listened to an audio book. And would there be any benefit of him for him to listen to an audiobook rather than a traditional book or an ebook? Well, I mean, I think the only real way of knowing is to, um, to is, is to try it. And I, if I could recommend any of the um, the books by Giles Christian, um, I think that might be a good place to start. I've heard that the narrator for um, or some of those, except for the um, oh, what's that called, the Bleeding Land series, which are fantastic books, well worth buying and reading. Um, uh, they're, they're meant to be quite good, but the others are meant to be amazing. The Bleeding Land and Brothers Fury, I like to call them my sleeping hits. <laughs> still sleeping, but one day... Still, sleep, still sleeping. One day they will awake Wake up. And, okay, let's move on. Let's see. Let's go to... Um, Mark McPherson says... Ask... Oh, he says, um, which character from the Viking books gives the best insults? And can you give a couple of examples? And you wouldn't mind hearing a new Bram the Bear insult, to be honest. Bram the Bear <laughs> um, is such, I want to tell you, such a fun character to write. Yeah, I mean, Bram's amazing. Um, oh, I miss that guy. I'm, I'm going to flick that, through and see if I can, I think if I can find any of Bram's, Bram's lines, they're all insults. I'm pretty sure that oh, that's, that's the only much. thing yeah, Bram says. Oh, and, <laughs> that, that and kill people. That's kind of his two things. Yeah, he's very good at both of those things. Oh, and drinking. He's, sort of, he's, he's talking to, people and killing people. He's good at drinking as well. So that's three things. <laughs> yeah, he is. Actually, um, three things, which is more than, you know, many of us. So There's a lot. Of, see, that's the thing. There's a lot of those people who I really love kind of bumping into. Is really, every time I see that Bram's got a line or that Olaf's got a line, because Olaf's pretty good at insulting people as well. Um. You don't know how much fun, well, you probably do know how much fun I had in the Viking books just making up insults, just trying to come up with an insult that I've never heard before. You know what I mean? Just sort of thinking, you know. It's, to be honest, it's one of the joys of those books is that yeah. there are so many absolutely mental... Um, yeah, I used to write funny books, now I think about it. I haven't written yeah. a funny book for ages. They've all got, they've all got serious, mate. All my um, books have gone sad now. They've all gone a bit serious. 
can't find any brand. I'm going to start right. flicking through and can't no, find tough. it. Write a new funny book. book. Right. Um, yeah, um, any brand. Yeah, any brand. That's where we were. But, um, Bram's insults were fantastic. Are fantastic. It's been such a long time since I've done the Viking books as well. I'm just wondering if I can, if I remember Bram, Bram always was a little bit of a, a bit of a funny voice like that. Yeah. <laughs> but it was all about the, the voice. It was, it was almost like he was he had a little bit of a speech impediment. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Only he'd know. No one would ever oh. say that to him. Um, no, well, they, they might say it to him, but they wouldn't say it again. I'm just, I'm just, just looking through, I'm already just falling over things like Norse asshole, a warrior behind Asfith called Sheep swiving shit, another man growled. How old are you, Björn Jolf? He asked. You were barely into that beard of yours and, led, and yet you lead these men. Are you a man of reputation? <laughs> these dicks. Good stuff, that stuff. I like it. I miss the, I miss the Viking crew. All right. Then. Yeah, they're awesome. Uh, Charlotte uh, Baldock says, how does one become an audiobook reader? Oh, well, that's a question. Good Maybe she's thinking question. about it. Um, by accident. Um, so, um, I... Um, <laughs> everyone's a turd in your books as well. I'm just flicking through this and being like, you're a turd. That's a turd. <laughs> Keep your mouth shut, Biani, you turd. That's a good word, actually. I should, <laughs> I, should bring that, I should bring that back. Bring back the turd. Um, didn't I just ask you to read my book or something? How did that happen? I can't remember. Uh, no, what happened was, um, I didn't just ask, you read my book. Um, what are you doing next week? You wanna... No, what happened was, um, you, were, you had written... Um, uh, I went, so I went to the um, Festival of History at Kelmarsh. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and we'd already worked together filmically and we'd done, I'd done a book trailer for you for, as a directing job. Um, and then I came to Kelmarsh. I was, act I was actually, I'd gone to Kelmarsh to um, have, have a chat with Mike Arnold. Um, um, but you were there. Um, oh. And... Uh, you had written, you, you had asked about your historical heroes and you'd written a saga tale about Harold Hardrada. Yes. Um, and I was in a kind of Q&A session in the audience listening to you and you read that. And I thought, God, that could be done better. Um, <laughs> uh, no doubt. I'm joking. No, I listened to it and I thought, that's awesome. Like, what a wicked piece of work. And you'd printed off versions of it to I, left, I left one on every chair, I believe. On every chair. And oh, I right. remember taking it home and I read it and I read it again and thought, this is so cool. Like a really, you know, and smoke up your ass, but it was very, very cool. Um, and I remember saying to you, like, do you mind if I do like an audio version of this and just, you know, read it for the, for the fun of putting it on audio? And you were like, yeah, that's fine. So I read it, did an audio version of it. And then, um, and then put it online. Uh, I think yeah, it would, put it on YouTube. I think you put it on YouTube. Put like a, a image behind it of Viking ship, and um, read it kind of Shakespeareanly, darling. Um, and then when it came through that you had your audio books commissioned for God of Vengeance, um, yeah. I remember. Um, I think it was your, your publisher, was it Simon, who contacted you and said, "Phil did a great job on the." on that thing you did, does he fancy sending an extract in for, for God of Vengeance? And so I went to the studio and did like a, a prologue extract. Or did, I can't remember, maybe we did the prologue extract as, some, as a promo thing, I can't remember. I, I, um, I can't remember. Back in and the, then the I submitted it like, you know, like an audition, I suppose. And yeah. the, the head of audio for um, yeah. Transworld, or you know, what was then Transworld, now yeah. Penguin Random House audio, came back and said, this is Ace, do you want to do the job? And I was yeah. like, uh, I don't know. I've never done an audio book before. How the hell does that work? Um, and yeah, it, and the rest is history. Absolutely. And since, since that time, you spent many a day in a dark room. Mm -hmm. And also recorded some audio books. And yeah. <laughs> uh, the next question is from 
Alexandra King, and she says, um, and she says, how do you prepare yourself for character changes within, within a chapter? E.g., do you get up, move around, have props, use your hands like a storyteller, look in the mirror, etc.? If only there was a mirror. Now, I've, I feel I, I have something to say about this because I, I came in to watch you recording on your last day of Camelot. I also, I came in on Lancelot as well and saw you crying like a baby, which was <laughs> embarrassing for both of us. But um, on Camelot, I came in to watch you and you were, well, you were positively Italian. You were just gesticulating all around the room. <laughs> you were everywhere. I do find, yeah, I find it's funny. I do, I do a thing and I don't, I'm sure that I'm well, may, maybe other audiobook readers do this, I don't know. Um, it's the thing, it's one of those things, it's like, as an audiobook reader, you don't really get an opportunity to watch what other audiobook readers do, so I've got no, no idea. I did sneak past Jonathan Keeble and have a look through his studio window just to see how he was doing it. And he had his shoes off, and I did think, maybe I should take my shoes off. I'm obviously doing it wrong. <laughs> That's his um, secret. It's, uh, yeah, get your bare feet on the carpet and you can feel it. Um, but yeah, I, t I, I do this thing where I will talk myself through the lines, because I'll have the text in front of me. And almost like I mentioned earlier about it being Kung Fu, I'll even, I'll have my arms outstretched and I'll be going, and so they, and it kind of helps me get through, especially your words, because you have, you, I call them um, nicely, I call them poetic knots. You create kind of these beautiful poetic knots, but they're very hard to kind of maneuver your way around um, vocally. So I find that physicalizing it actually helps me. Um, also, if I'm acting a scene and I'm actually doing a scene and I'm talking about things, and I'm, you know, and I'm going, get him, ah! you know, and it's got a lot more kind of energy to it. I need to move. I can't help it. Often the producer will be like, yeah, you, you need to not do that anymore because you were off mic there or you, you know, you've banged into something or your elbows are banging the chair or, you know, and I'm like, get him, ah! Um, you just decapitated the tea boy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do gesticulate an awful lot. Um, and going back to the question earlier, I go kind of just try and flip between characters because I know them as well as I possibly can. Good one. Craig Longley says, how do you manage the challenging Norse names and the language? I think you've covered <laughs> He doesn't really manage it. He just phones me up and swears at me. Yeah. So, um, oh yeah, actually this is relevant. And this is, this is a question from me. Uh, just to talk about any tricks of the trade, uh, you just mentioned that the, the famous Jonathan Keeble taking off his shoes. Do you have a routine and can you explain to the listeners, the viewers, should I say, your, the cushion technique? <laughs> or is it the pillow technique? I don't know whether you go cushion or full on pillow. Um, okay, so basically there's a bunch of stuff that I do. Um, so I, I find that... I need to make sure that I eat the right things um, because your stomach does talking too. Um, and my stomach does more talking than most, I think. Um, so I have to be really careful of what I eat throughout the day. Um, so I can't have a big breakfast. I can't have a big lunch. I have to kind of eat small amounts throughout the day. Otherwise my stomach complains and well, I end up kind of doing a line and then my stomach goes, and then the, the producers will have to do that again. Um, so I've now reached this kind of comfortable spot where pastries and bananas, which is like probably not the healthiest thing in the world, but that's my breakfast most mornings, I'll have pastry and bananas. And then at lunchtime, I'll have like um, some like a small amount of rice and something, or maybe um, never sandwiches, never bread, never never something bulky because then you have to wait for it to digest before you can actually start reading again. Mm. Rice cakes are amazing. Rice cakes are a brilliant thing to kind of just, if, you, if your stomach starts rumbling, you can just eat a rice cake really quickly and then, you know, you don't need to, um, you don't need to worry too much. No, he's opened his whiskey. Um, it's water, darling. Of course it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Like I will make sure, first thing I do is I'll take off my watch, take off my rings. Um, I will, um, there's the, the cushion thing. Yeah, sometimes you can protect yourself. You can protect your stomach talking 
by putting a cushion over your stomach so that it muffles it. See, this is, now this is, we should, like we can scrap everything that we've set up to now. This is what people want to know. They want to imagine you sitting so, there, hugging yeah, the cushion, and crying yeah. your eyes out, crying like a baby, <laughs> snuggling, snuggling your little cushy. You do, and I, I do actually like, hug the cushion and end up in this kind of hunched up sort of like which, which probably affects my voice somewhat um a lot of a lot of readers i know <laughs> right anyway i thought you would appreciate that shakespeare quote yeah well, well done. Thank um, you. but yes the um yeah. the 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 diet's very important very very interesting so that's how we go at um rose cullerton well you know when writing, do, do you imagine the look and sound of the character before, during, or after? Oh no, this is for me. Do I imagine? Yeah. Look do you? you? Yeah, before I put pen to paper, and do I convey this to you or let you come up with the voices on your own? Yeah, so I do it as I'm writing. So what I'll do is I'll write the character, I'll write some character dialogue, and then as I get to know that character, I'll go back and change the way he speaks because I know him better. Or her better so I know now it's sort of I sort of read back and look at it and I read back and I go no that character doesn't speak like this now I know them so I go back and I will change it and everything so that's the way I do that um, and then do do I convey this to you no I don't really because the thing is Phil he really knows my books probably as well as I do and so he's I'm gonna to be totally happy I can see a lightsaber coming <laughs> I can see a lightsaber <laughs> creeping into shots here mate I did see, I was like, what's that? He's meant to have his pyjamas on. Hang on a second. Right, okay. Uh, Gosh, doesn't get your jimmy's on. Okay, go for it. They're not. They're not in Get those pyjamas on, Axe Man. It's, it's, I, I tell you what, they could be in here, but I just don't think they are. Um, okay, so that's that. Owen Ward Knives wants to know how many takes it takes from the studio to nail a paragraph. Says you do a brilliant job of conveying the urgency in the character's interaction and uh, your transfer between the character voices is really good and the you you. stories to life. Uh, he's listened to over 50 historical fiction audiobooks and says mm. you're one of, one of the best narrators he's heard. Oh, I should have, oh, I should have brought this one into the conversation. Um, so what you. was the question in that was how many takes? But I, how many takes? Um, it depends um it just depends on it depends on loads of stuff like sometimes you find that you know i can go for pages and pages without stopping and then sometimes i can do like a line and, and then another line and then stop and then another line and, and then uh, get back to the audio book yeah <laughs> um, hey, you said that um no, I, I do find that it's got a lot to do with sometimes where you are in the day. Sometimes you get to kind of like mid afternoon and bear in mind that when you're doing an audio book, you're in the studio from nine in the morning until five or six mm -hmm. and you are sat in a black box, like running a mental marathon. It sounds really dramatic, but when I first yep. did it, I thought, Hey, you know, come on, you get to sit in a box and read a book for the day. Like how hard can it be? It's very um, hard. And it's really, very hard. I've, um, I've seen how intense it is. It's such intense work. Um, it's mentally challenging. It's physically challenging. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, I, when you get home, you know, after that day, you must be completely exhausted. Yeah, it, it absolutely buggers you up like, more yeah. than I ever expected to be the case. It's mm -hmm. physically exhausting. Yeah. I think because you are concentrating so much on making sure that you don't get any lines or words wrong as, as often as you possibly can obviously it's not hugely possible but i know that there are i think there are certain different types of readers i think there's readers that do really well at flow and yeah. they can just read the line and read the line and read the line and read the line but yeah. i think often they lose a bit of inflection and a bit of maybe a bit of the poetry because it's it's trying to flow and i find that sometimes i get annoyed with myself because the bits that i've really nailed the flow of and i haven't made a mistake for a long time i feel don't have the same kind of energy or mm. um or kind of impetus as a lot of other things that when i get to stop and do a line again i yeah. get to really hit that line hard um so, so it just varies very much so um yeah, so what was that the whole question? I can't remember. Let's yeah, see. it'll need to be because we, we're, uh, I think we've been on for a, quite a while actually. Yeah, over so that's me, me going on. 
Um, so Dan Mills, as in Sniper One, Sergeant Dan Mills, the uh, author of the incredible, incredible Sniper One, asked, how did I go about picking Phil? Well, we've talked about that now. And uh, was I looking for something particular in the voice? Well, uh, I think I was always a, uh, an advocate, and which is why we sent that audition through to, to, to the publisher, because I just knew that you would get my books, you would get the writing, you would get the characterization, and you happen to have talent to, to, to do a better job than anybody else I can imagine ever doing it. So that's really... I think you did. You know, I, um, I, I, I just can't imagine anybody... Um, uh, yeah, and that's, in, that's until do, do, Jonathan Keeble comes along. You know, yeah, until, until Jonathan Keeble kind of <laughs> knocks on my door. <laughs> and I'd be quite happy to go, yeah, just do it with Jonathan Keeble. No, so that's there. Um, that's there. Uh, Tom Oliver Hinton says he can't wait for Camelot and says it'll be the best birthday present this year for sure. I think that's, sure. a, bold, that's a bold claim. But um, probably accurate. But it's possibly true. Yeah. And he says... Will Siegel or Raven, this is a question for me, will Siegel or Raven ever return? My answer to that is, I think we've already discovered here this evening that I do miss the Viking crew and I miss that kind of writing. Yes, I can still play with the, the, the language. It can still be lyrical in a really kind of gruff way. The, you know, the, the vocabulary that I'm able to draw on in the Viking books is far, far narrower than, than Lancelot, for example. But there's still an ebb and flow to the to the to the to the text that I can really get into and enjoy. There's definitely characters like Peleas that's got like you know they've definitely got a fighting feel of them, even though they've got West Country accents. They've got that same sort of humour. Yeah, I suppose he has got a bit actually. Peleas, bless him. Yeah, that's, but but if I do, I would like to get back to Raven or Sigurd. Or I might do something a new a new Viking book entirely. I think you know those the, the North first. Forces are calling me, so I think I do need to get back there at some point quite soon. But that was a question for me. And then for you, it's who is well, who's been your favourite character uh, to embody and to take on as a role? Did we say it's got to be, be Merlin? Merlin, yeah, that's, it's that's got to be Merlin, yeah. Rebecca Hill says, what did you think when Giles first asked you to narrate his books? Crazy? Excited? Nervous? Honoured? Oh, all of the above. Obviously. Yeah. Um, how and when and where did he ask? So we've, we've gone through that now. But I think you felt particularly honoured and um, incredibly excited. And, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I, I think it was the happiest... I'm, I'm, am I right in thinking it was the happiest day of your life or? yeah pretty much i mean uh, yeah it definitely you know the birth of my children yeah it, it, the, the, they paled in, into insignificance when i found out um, that's, that's, what, I was be really that's what i thought and now uh, no I, no seriously very honored um i was genuinely and i'm still honored it's still a great privilege to me to be able to do these books um and be part of that world and also there's a kind of legacy aspect to it where i get you know maybe one day my grandkids can listen to me reading these stories that actually are, I'm invested in in a way that it's not, you know, they're not just books to me that, you know, they're, they're part of my emotional makeup now that, you know, those characters mean, I think in a way they mean more to me, I feel personally than anybody in the world because I have inhabited them to such a degree, and I've read the book so many times, and I'm so involved in that world now that they are very, very personal to me. So to, to be able to keep to keep doing it and to keep um, being part of your world is an incredible pleasure. So it's an honour, it really is. And so you're going to say, where's my cushion to snuggle and cry into? <laughs> Richard Main says, have you sw ever swallowed a fly during recording? No, luckily. Um, no, there are no flies. No flies, no, no flies on me. Okay. Um, that would be unlucky, I think, especially as you've got a sort of a pop shield between yourself and the microphone. Yeah. And if one managed to get in there, I think, well, fair play to it. Yeah, absolutely. Hello. Okay, Rose Cullerton. Have we had Rose Cullerton? No. She said, do you read the novel first to get a feel for the story and characters? How much do you rely on my input? How many times do you have outtakes? And some of the scenes are pretty graphic, and there are also a lot of laugh out loud moments as well. And who's your favourite character? 
Yeah, there are. There's loads of outtakes. There's certainly loads of outtakes. Um, yeah. I think I, in fact, just a couple of days ago, I was uploading something to my YouTube channel and I found an unlisted video of outtakes from the Viking, from the Stigard saga, which I'll, I'll send to you at some point because I've completely forgotten that existed. Right, I'd like to, um, very much like to hear which that. Which is quite entertaining with me yeah. just basically swearing a lot and going blah, 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 blah um, and cocking up the words. Okay. Um, yeah, it happens quite a lot. Um, so yeah. yeah, as we've just discussed before, read it and um, there's definitely outtakes. And yeah, Merlin, Merlin from, from the, although I did love Pelias as well, mm. um, yeah. but from the Sigurd books, Olaf, it's all about Olaf, definitely. Okay, yeah. Well, I think, you're, I think we're gonna peg you down to play Olaf if it gets to screen. Oh, I'm so wanna play Olaf, <laughs> definitely. Um, if anyone wants to listen to any extracts, you can go on to Amazon and you can click on to audiobook and listen to an extract. So if you're interested to hear any of Phil's renditions from any of my books, you can just do that to get a sample of it, or you can go on to audible.co.uk. You can just find me online and I'll just read to you. Yeah. <laughs> or Phil will come to your house and read the whole book to you. So, um, yeah, that's, I guess that's it, really. I mean, there were a couple of, I think that's about it, yeah. Probably for the best. Yeah, it, we've been on a long time. Camelot is out in two weeks' time, so hopefully a lot of people will be getting that. So get your pre yeah, go you know. out, get the book, get then get the audio book. Um, and do both. The, I think really get the hardback, get the yeah. ebook and the audio book. I think just to have everything. Then buy it in paperback when it comes out. Yeah, a year later buy it in paperback as well, because then I think you've got the whole exp the whole experience, the whole Camelot experience. I think it's important. Yeah, yeah I think it's important. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank cool. you for watching, everybody. Thanks to Philip Stevens. It's a boy. shame that my hand doesn't appear in yours. That, like the fact that we've been sat together the whole time, self-isolating together. That would be. A... I can't even begin to think what you're on about. <laughs> so um, thank you ever so much. It's been really good to talk to you. I think it's been interesting. I hope so. Thank I you. I was going to say enlightening, but I think that was perhaps too much. Too no, I think I was going to say, I think that's probably giving me too much credit, but um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for your questions, everybody. Um, and yeah, please do keep listening and keep reading. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to read these books and hopefully I can continue. Unless Jonathan Keeble comes along. Thank you, mate. Good luck.